This is just one of the innumerable streams and rivulets that crisscross the Dibang Valley in northeast India. World of the Idu Mishmis. Jekutayo is an Idu Mishmi, a tribe quite unknown and barely documented. Until a few years ago, foreigners were banned here. Even Indians still need a permit to enter the area, an outpost touching the borders of Bhutan, Tibet, China and Myanmar. The Idu Mishmis are one of the three Mishmi tribal groups. It is believed the Idus were the first to migrate from Myanmar and settle here. In the past, the Idus journeyed across the borders in search of salt. It was the basis for the barter trade they survived on. Geographical borders have restricted that option in recent times, and it seems as if the Idus are still struggling to shift over from a barter economy to a cash economy. At a per capita income of just over $800, the Idus are poor and they know it. Life in these long houses on stilts has hardly changed. Some domesticated animals, agriculture, hunting, fishing, generations have moved on. Idus like Jeko hardly care for the speedy progress of the outside world. The Dibang Valley is part of the state of Arunachal Pradesh where sunrise first strikes India. Cocooned in remoteness, the Idus covet their isolated identity. Idu. I like all that we have, our clothes, hat, dagger. I don't like the clothes people wear nowadays, trousers, shirts. We are Idus and should wear Idu clothes. My clothing is Idu, we never had shoes or socks, but we managed to reach wherever we wanted to go without them. The world of the Idus today is one of dichotomies. Between the old and the new, myth and reality, the unknown past and a growing awareness of the present. The longhouses with eaves coming very low protect Idus from heavy rainfall, often the heaviest in the country, up to 300 centimeters. Yet, they have not been blessed with a fertile soil they could exploit for agriculture. Parts of the Dibang Valley belong to a biosphere reserve, a hotspot of biodiversity. But the ecological knowledge of the Idus is enwrapped in oral literature which has not yet been well explored. For a few months of the year, village Alinya can be reached by a fair weather road from the nearest town about 20 kilometers away. The scenario in the sparsely inhabited village is typical. Not another longhouse in sight for maybe half a mile. Inside, the Idu world. Animal skulls displayed as prizes and wealth. The welcoming hearth where the family gathers. This is Kasama's home. Here, elements, nature, animals are humanized into a wondrous world of myths. And uh, the people of any village, when they die, their soul go to the same place. Among us, rich or poor, the soul goes to one place. The difference between the rich and the poor we make in our world. Kasama also tells us a story about why the Idus have no wealth and riches. We, the Mismis, say that Asova and Anova were born before the Idu. 
So we Idus, the youngest, had nothing, no land, no seed, no grain, no money, no scriptures. That's why we couldn't learn to read and write like you. The Idus have another story to explain their situation. They believe the Chinese and Idus were brothers. One day, deep in the jungles, the two brothers had a fight over a misunderstanding. When we, the Idus, separated, they talk about splitting shears on the land. We, Idus, say no. They talk about sharing the money. We, Idus, say no. We don't want it. We didn't bring anything, just ran away and came. That is why we are living here in the jungle like this. The Idus are known for their inherent skills in bridge building and other kinds of construction with bamboo. When knowledge was distributed, they say, the Idus drank up the ink and smeared some over themselves. So, as they claim, their knowledge is within them. The surrounding forests abound in bamboo. Over generations, Idus have mastered the ways to skin, shear, mold and weave bamboo, a skill that also helps them to make the most of their impoverished lives. Jiko Tayo is accomplished in various forms of construction, whether it is to build the newly fashionable toilet or to repair the village bridge. Geographically cut off from the outside world, the Idus have been deprived of information. Agriculture is primitive among the Idus, but they are conscious of their low level of productivity. Earlier, the seeds for rice were not good. One had to work very hard to grow it. Even after much labor, there would not be a good harvest. Then, a bird called Ipi brought good quality seeds and dropped them here. Since then, we have had a better harvest. That is how one story goes. Kasama is meeting up with his niece today. Joromega works on his fields in return for rice. She labors hard, but is dejected after almost every harvest. After spending one's own money, employing so many people, still it is not a good harvest. The status of Idu women is what it would be in polygamous societies. Women learn to share their men and live happily in spite of it. They work hard. The meat of the animals is banned for women. They eat as well as they can, drink and stay merry. In their own mystical way, the Idus reassure women of their indispensability. The story goes, after the apocalypse, only a bow and arrow were left, from which a child was born. The son asked the eagle to place it in the man's stomach. The pregnant man delivered the child with great difficulty, but then could not breastfeed it. The son told a goddess to give birth to a woman with breasts who could feed the child. So the goddess sent a woman to the man and she fed the child. Elders who pass on this world of myths to each generation are highly respected among the Idus. Hey, I hope you waited for me. Until legal governance came to this region, the Idus had their own judicial system. The system made up of elders and the wise revolved around the Abala or village council and the Kebang or court, with the basis of a judgment of consensus through intermediaries. The land you are talking about is located behind the demarcated area. It could be a land dispute or murder. 
It may need negotiation. Elder men and women decide the strategy. The aim of severe punishment, mostly monetary, is meant to ensure the crime is not committed again. It could even be death in case of crimes like marriages between close cousins. Jeko, Sipa and others sportingly demonstrate how an Idu Abala is conducted. No one is wrestling away anyone's land wrongfully. Stop fighting. There's work to do. My grandfather placed these stones. I won't let go of this field so easily. The forests of this region are said to be the center of origin for all the bananas and citrus fruits of the world. It is a tough habitat. Formidable heights, gorge-like valleys. The Idus would hunt in groups for animals like deer and bears for weeks on end in the forests, or cross the mountain passes for salt and trade. Such basic needs have diminished. But the spirit of common effort hasn't. Relatives live on both sides of the river Dri. There are fields on either side of the bridge. The monsoon will turn river Dri into a turbulent force. The bridge will be the only lifeline for the local inhabitants. Whether the bridge will hold out the season is a question the Idus grapple with every year. During imminent bad weather, the villagers always check on the bridge. The inspection may need to be done three, four times a year. People from four, five villages use this bridge. We are the ones who have to repair it regularly. The bridge is not in great shape. We should ask the government to build a metal bridge. Even so, this needs urgent repairs. We should really talk to the government so that we finally get the metal bridge. Yeah, you are right. Bamboo is depleting. We should talk to them. You should. You are the eldest. We do all the work. The government does nothing. The government only think about the army border roads. The bridge is so dangerous. Small children, women could fall and drown when it is weak. One of us should negotiate with them. I could tell the government a thing or two. But they would not understand me. They don't understand our language and I don't understand theirs. I don't know any of them either. But something has to be done. We can't keep accepting the situation as it is. Away from the stress of the bridge repair, this is Drinu Mi. He was appointed as an intermediary between the Idus and the government to arbitrate on village issues and demands. Trinu is a wealthy man. The innumerable animal skulls on the walls of his house speak for themselves. It assures him a wealthy status and the right to as many wives as he wishes. He also has the honor of being a medicine man. Drinu does not remember his first kill. Maybe a deer, the rare musk deer. He hasn't been hunting for nearly 20 years since he took up a job. Drinu is also old and sick. He hardly moves away from the house now. At home, Drinu basks in the glory of his two wives' family. How many times you marry depends on your capacity. If you can afford to marry ten times, you marry ten times. Earlier, people would marry ten, nine, eight times, or three, four, depending on your waist and how many animals and money you have. Idus are very particular that no marriage can take place between relatives going back up to 13 generations. 
Breaking that rule can mean death for the couple. My sons can also marry three, four times. There is nothing to stop them, as they wish. They may think one is enough. Or they may think they need to marry twice or thrice. In this world, Tara in his jeep is a strange sight. Tara belongs to another tribe in the same state. He has some affinity with the Idus, but education, university and a top-notch job as a journalist has created gaps. Now, whenever he can, Tara wishes to bridge these gaps and catch up on his roots. The other world Tara belongs to has taken a few steps into this land of unapproached people. They are hesitant steps. What kind of development? How much of it? Today, world opinion is increasingly divided on ideas about equal opportunities and maintaining the pristine glory of Aboriginal peoples. Obviously, the decisions are not easy. Kasama's home is the natural stop for Tara. They have met before. It will again be an occasion for a good dinner. There is a lot for Kasama and Tara to catch up on. How many kills? Who got himself another wife? Who has how many children now? Though Tara is quite familiar with these surroundings, he cannot help being amazed at the skills he sees in action. This is really designer wear. A bamboo spoon is just being carved out for his dinner. Tara tries to find out about some more Idu myths, which he will add to his personal diary. Kasama obliges him. He also uses the opportunity to once again make Tara understand the gravity of the issue of the metal bridge and the need to build a proper road to reach village Alini. The usual Idu meal consists of rice with some chilies and salt. But today, Tara is here and one of Kasama's two wives has a special spread for him. Geographical conditions combined with apathy have kept access to health facilities very poor in these areas. Rain-related cholera deaths, especially of children, is very common. But specific information about the Idus of Alini is hard to come by. <laughs> Over dinner, Kasama had promised to exhibit some belongings of his grandfather. It is all such fun. The bag made of bear skin, medicinal roots. Idus swear by the miracle properties of the Mishmitita, the botanical Kopistita. It is said to have antifungal and antibacterial properties. For centuries, Idus have used it to cure fevers, backaches, anything. And then, of course, the symbol of Idu pride, the great knife they call Tao. Tara's mind grapples with the Idu past and present. Though ancient Indian epics of the 2nd and 3rd century BC refer to this region, there are no historical records till the 16th century. The closest one comes to history here is the Idu oral tradition. Myths that mesh the Dibang Valley habitat with Idu hopes, dreams and fears. The Mithun, a high altitude cattle, is closely linked to Idu life. 
It is both domesticated and a prized kill. The Brofrontalis or Mithun is the ultimate symbol of Idu prestige, who still reckon value and price, including bright price, with head counts of the Mithun. Kasama recounts an Idu tale about the Mithun. On a festive occasion, a man was doing his worship ritual with a Mithun, and a Mithun attacked and killed him. The man's wife was very sad and kept crying as her tears dropped. From them were created elephants, bears, cows, all animals. That is how it is in the story. Tara meets up with Jeko Tayo. It is another chance to pick up some notes. Jeko, the man on the move, has a lot to tell Tara. Hunting is no longer a prerequisite for survival. In fact, Idus now usually get together for a hunt during the festive season. Or just go on a hunt for the pleasure of it. Jeko only hunts with a gun. It was different in the days of his father. A group of five, six men with backpacks full of 50, 60 kilos of rations away in the jungles for five, six weeks at a time. Jeko recalls hunting with his father as an adolescent. My father used to hunt with the bow and arrow. So why do you hunt with a gun? It's more convenient. <laughs> For the arrow, we have to go very far, deep into the forest, to find the poison. That is why we now hunt with the gun. Jeko, the boss man, has arrived for the bridge repair. The plan to meet up at the site has been made earlier, and the volunteers are here to get on with the job. From gathering and preparing the bamboo raw material to fixing the bridge, the process is a long and tedious one. No one seems unduly perturbed with the effort for the safety of their own villagers and others who use the bridge. The Dibang Valley is one of the two poorest districts in the state in terms of surfaced road. The planned road cuts across a large number of rivers. The construction of about 18 bridges has been under investigation. Nearly 46 water gaps require major bridges. But during and after every monsoon, the rivers change course. Engineers face an improbable task of finalizing the construction. The Idus are fearless. They would not hesitate to avenge a murder with murder. Their basic concept of justice is, the one who causes suffering must suffer. Ironically, the Idus have themselves been a victim of such justice in their mythical past. A beautiful woman, Rukmini, was promised in marriage King Bismarck. Her brother Rukma had already incased the bright prize. But another king, Krishna, wanted to marry Rukmini and abducted her. Rukma was angry. A bloody war was imminent. Rukmini threw herself between them and in despair, requested Krishna to spare her brother's life. Krishna relented at a price, cut off Rukma's forehead here. Ever since, Idu have worn the hair like Rukma. So goes the tale. Idu Mishmi is the formal term. But the Idus are more popularly known as Chulikata, meaning those with the top front crown of hair cut in a straight line. This haircut is the primary identification mark for any Idu Mishmi. This is Kasama's daughter-in-law, Parthi. The Idus say 
Nature gave them designs, waves, ripples, patterns of bamboo trees, butterfly wings, fish scales. Parthi's mother-in-law, Dumiya, is one of Kasama's two wives. She wonders why such a fuss is being made over the weaving. First time anyone has come and asked about the weaving. After all, such weaving was always done. Parthi still enjoys the status of an only wife, but for how long? Men can marry twice, everyone keeps two wives. A woman has no say, that's how it is. If a man is wealthy, it is his pleasure. Parthi stayed back with her parents for eight years after her wedding. The Idus really respect the wishes of a woman. Polygamy, of course, is another matter. I'll not be angry if he's able to look after the children and me. Then he can stay with the second wife as well. I'll not be angry. The older Dumia has other things on her mind. When a woman becomes a widow, she does not go back to her mother's home. Rather, she can marry one of the brothers of her husband or someone else in the same village. Or if she falls in love, she is married off by the village. Dumia proudly says that Parthi has not fought even once since she came to this household. But she was getting a bit skeptical with the chat which she felt was getting too personal and intrusive. In village Alinie, Dizu has many aspiring learners. Many youngsters want to become an acclaimed fish trap maker like him. Dizu has sent Jeevan to bring some bamboo. Jeevan knows these are the first steps before he too can weave a fish trap in less than half an hour. This is the same bamboo used for the bridge, just one piece, the same deftness with the same dao and a perfect fish trap at the end of it. Did the Idus bring these skills with them where they came from centuries ago? Or did they learn as they journeyed along the river course? For as long as they can remember, each child has learnt from the elders. That is how it has always been, an Idu would say. There is so much that no one knows about the Idu Mishmis, their origins, the migratory route, blending with the habitat, the change from food gathering to agriculture, the history behind their myths. The vivid imagery of Idu myths may get dimmed faster than ever before. The remoteness of the Idus now has links. A fair weather road takes Idus out to town. As entry permits get easier, adventure trek announcements are on the increase. Helicopters bring rations and people. The treacherous fair weather road is now seen as a challenge for adventure seekers. It may be yet another alien experience for the Idus. Why would anybody seek danger while they themselves endlessly propitiate the gods to protect them in this terrain? The repair operation of the bridge has begun. Though it is Kasama who wears the red mantle of elders, Everyone will await the instructions of young Jekyll. The risks are immense and the response must be at a level of zero error. After two days of tedious teamwork, 
The railings are nearly redone, but Jekko has doubts about the floor. If there is a doubt, it will not be left unattended. Another day of repair work. Well, it will be done. Hey, come here. Just take this trip. Come on. Give us a helping hand. Yeah. This trip here, it's not heavy. You can easily carry it. Come on, take it along to the bridge. The forests of Arunachal Pradesh are home to nearly one third of the hundred odd species of Indian bamboo. Naturally, communities like the Idus use the cane and bamboo for a variety of purposes. This should be the last trips. I think we have enough. Just this one here, then I'll also get along to the bridge. Okay. Now we can take all the strips onto the bridge. Bamboo is often called the poor man's timber. For the Idus, it is the primary and only source for building their bridges. The Idus will certainly need to depend on their mastery in the art of building bridges across treacherous gorges. With prolonged monsoons, it is difficult to transport modern bulky building equipment in these areas. It will be a long time before the Idus get an alternative. The villagers all have a profound awareness of the dangers of a weak bridge. Their effort is driven by a sense of empathy for their women children, animals, who can be at the mercy of a turbulent river. With nearly three spates of floods every year, the Idus of Aligne obviously have no option but to carry on with their proven systems of survival. Areas like the Dibang Valley in Arunachal Pradesh have been known as the Forbidden Land since the British established the inner line in 1875. It prohibited visitors, even missionaries, to come here. The Idus have survived amidst their unusual ecology in almost absolute isolation and are deeply attached to their land, which is suffused with the legends of their ancestors. Idus follow the chirping of birds like Pimbi Pau to decide the time for sowing and harvesting. Idus cultivate mixed crops like maize, oil seeds, ginger, turmeric. But they are often pushed into distress sales where they get about 15% of their due price. Birds are also a great menace which severely deplete their crops. These are the ingenious bamboo clap traps they have devised to frighten away the birds. The clap traps perform a dual function. It creates a chain of clap traps while it distributes water from the nearby stream or river through an intricate network of bamboo pipes. Small signs of change are visible. Sipa Melo on his motorcycle is a common sight for the villagers of Alinia now. For a few months every year, he works on construction sites in the nearest town. 
it has exposed him to the other world. Many young Idus go to town in search of similar work. Sipa is also a medicine man deeply rooted in his Idu traditions. The dichotomy persists. We are not stupid. We know what is happening in the world. The time is ripe for change. What was sacrosanct earlier need not remain so forever, naturally. We want to retain our culture, not give up its good points. But if other people have something which can make life easier, why should we not have it too? You see, there are some illnesses which are not cured even after going to the hospital. Even after taking medicines, maybe a cause or spirit has attached itself or something else that cannot be resolved with medicines, so they have to get it resolved by us. Slash and burn cultivation has been common among the Idus, like in many tribal communities. But now it is not so much for fertilizing the land. Land is cleared because families like this one need space to build a new longhouse. Whatever the reason, the practice continues and women stand vigil through the night so that the village is not engulfed in a fire by mistake. Idus never take powerful elements for granted. The Idus have a story about the sun and the moon, said to be brothers. The moon said to the sun, let us dry up the earth, its mountains and rivers, everything. The sun said, no, the earth was destroyed in the apocalypse. We must save it. It is we who can save it. The moon was shamefaced and the angry brother's son pushed the moon into the slush and stamped out his heat. The moon pleaded, Brother, like you, I too want to help the earth survive. Please let me be the one they look to when there is a newborn, when months, seasons and years change, when it is time to sow and harvest. That is how the earth began to calculate with the waning and waxing of the moon. Sipa Melo's faith in the powers of the medicine man is not isolated. Idus believe the priests and shamans are blessed with supernatural powers. The belief does not stop them from approaching modern medical help, but it remains the ultimate recourse. Takade has already been treated for paralysis at a hospital. He hasn't been cured. Now Takade requested for a Bamani the shaman to be called. The ritual can extend up to a few days. In his litanies, the Bamani chants. Disease of the wind, disease of the water, disease of the mountains, disease of the field, you are so great. Why have you attached yourself to this unknowing man? Please leave him and go back to your place. But the dichotomy still persists. Takade's daughter was doubtful. While the ritual was in progress, she begged the crew to send her some oils and creams from the big city. The work on the bridge is nearing completion. Taking a break over a drink, Kasama and Jeko share some thoughts. I learned bridge building from my father. My father always took me along, explained everything, taught me rope making. In our village, every man 
nose breeds building. It's just that some are better than the others. We should never forget what we have learned from our ancestors. Neither should our children. We must retain our culture, the way we cultivate our fields, the way we live. We are Idu and want to remain Idu. We should not allow anyone to take anything away from our way of life. We want to carry on living the same way that our Idu ancestors used to. The Idus are facing the first pangs of change as they develop a growing awareness of what they need. The metal bridge is a dire necessity for them as Kasama well knows. But young adults like Jeko already sense the imminent danger of losing their identity and heritage as metal roads and bridges bring the outside world closer. Their bamboo bridges are an inherent part of the isolated Idu identity in the lonely mountains up at 5,000 feet. Idus across two generations like Kasama and Jeko seem determined to clearly define their Idu identity in the present times. There are about 55,000 Idu Mishmis in the sparsely inhabited Dibang Valley. Each of them who live amidst this ecological treasure house is bonded through legend and myth with an undocumented ancestral past. The classic Indian epics and Idu myths are linked in ancient times dating back to four, five thousand years. But where the Idus go in the future is as baffling as their mysterious historical past. Oh, yeah.